We're delighted to have you here today, Professor Krasner. You have been at Stanford University since... 1981. 1981, and you are the Graham H. Stewart Professor of International Relations. You're also a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute and at the Hoover Institution. And from 2005 to 2007, you were the director of um, policy planning staff at the State Department. Correct. So your, your work is seminal. I think it's fair to say you're one of the most read international relations scholars in the world. But it's really in 1999 when you wrote Sovereignty as Organized Hypocrisy, I think that the world of international relations scholars turned around and, and really started to think much more seriously, uh, rethink the concept of sovereignty. And over the last um, 15 years or so, you seem to have been very focused on issues of how do we deal with failed states, weak states, how do we, the West, the United States, and Europe, um, and the so-called international community govern. You've talked about shared sovereignty, about trusteeships, but you come to SOAS today really to talk about this concept of good enough governance, good enough governance. Mm-hmm. So, so what is that? Yeah, so I think that, you know, good enough governance would be, so I th- let me say, I think that a fundamental problem for, and l- let me say American foreign policy, although I think this is also true for the OECD world in general, is that we have no sense, if we're looking at badly governed, weakly governed states, we have no sense of where they can end up in between Somalia and Denmark. So if you look at the Bush administration, um, I think now, I mean, my people that were in more important positions than I was in in the administration would say that we tried to do too much. If you look at the Obama administration, and especially Obama's recent interview in the Atlantic, uh, the general consensus would be that Obama tried to do too little. Well, it's fine to say we tried to do too much or we tried to do too little, but if there's something in between too much and too little, what is that? And this idea of good enough governance is, at least as a working concept, is what I'm trying to focus on. And so how do you, how do you give that weight or graft? What is good enough? So I think the starting point in understanding what we might realistically accomplish I mean, has to actually be something which starts with some understanding of how economic and political development take place. Mm-hmm. Historically, I mean, if you... If you look at human history, in almost all places, for almost all periods when human beings have been on the earth, life has been nasty, brutish, and short. And not just for the reasons that Hobbes pointed out, that is that there was no government, but also because when there was a government, the government basically engaged in rape, pillage, and taxation. That's what governments did. Uh, people in political power tried to protect themselves and their cousins and their aunts and the guys they needed who had weapons to keep them in power. But they certainly had almost no concern for the population as a whole. So getting to London in 2016 or any of these other advanced industrialized places, that's a very extraordinary accomplishment. And the question is, Is this something that we would expect to happen naturally? In which case, we can think about putting all countries on the road to Denmark. Or should we rather, which I think is really more accurate, think about this as a very extraordinary development in a relatively small number of countries in the world, uh, which isn't going to be easy to systematically replicate in any way. In which case, we're not gonna confidently put countries on the road to Denmark. We don't have to let them think that they're just going to deteriorate. So we need to think about some more realistic set of objectives. And let me say that I think the key is the goals that we pursue have to be goals that are incentive compatible with the goals of national political leaders. If those national leaders are actually operating in a genuinely democratic system, it's great. And you might really think about putting countries on the road to Denmark. Uh, If those political leaders are operating essentially in a rent-seeking, corrupt environment in which corruption is fundamentally necessary for them to stay in power, we have to think about objectives that they might find acceptable. And that's where this good enough governance term comes from. Okay. So what about, what about the public? What about the people in these countries? Are they sort of out of the equation? 
um, civil society activists, um, all the sort of, you know, the broader constituencies that, that the West has really thought about engaging with. You know, it's not just elites and governments that are, that are central. So I, I don't think it's a bad idea to try and engage with civil society, but I would say two things. One is that by supporting civil society, don't think that you're guaranteeing some transition to Denmark. Um, that might or might happen. In fact, it's more likely that it won't happen, one. Two, let's recognize that it's very difficult for external actors to understand what's going on in a country. And three, recognize that civil society organizations and other organizations operating in these places, they have their own strategic interests. They're trying to spin us in the same way that we're trying to spin them. So I don't think it's a bad thing to be engaged with civil society, but I'm skeptical of the idea that simply by making investments on the ground beneath the state or around the state that we can guarantee a set of conditions that will lead to Econo sustained economic growth and democratization. And, and do you take that next step? Because some people would argue that actually by holding out the carrot to civil society, that it's, that it's not only um, difficult to move a, an entire country forward, but that you risk uh, provoking a backlash, right? By sort of inspiring civil society and empowering them, it's more likely that elites will, you know, crack the whip and come down much harder and, and do what we've seen in Turkey and Egypt and Russia and a number right. of... Right. So I think this countries. is a, a serious problem, which, first of all, I want to say I have not really thought through in an adequate way. But I do think the problem is exactly the one that you're pointing to, that by trying to do too much, you may actually leave people worse off. Mm. So in a situation in which there are indigenous demands, and we might be fairly confident that these are indigenous demands, it, it would, I think, make sense to support them if we can actually figure out what's going on, which often we can't. But I'll give you one example, which for me is really very striking, and that is SISIC in Guatemala. So SISIC in Guatemala is an entity that was established around 2005 by an agreement between the government of Guatemala and the Secretary General of the UN. It's an entity, an organization, which is staffed by people from outside Guatemala, which is empowered to conduct investigations, not actually engage in prosecutions, but in, conduct investigations of high-level crimes. And a CISIC investigation actually forced the president of Guatemala to, to resign several months ago. Now, that's a stunning outcome. And if the Guatemalan president had understood that he was going to be forced to resign, he never would have done this in the first place. And CISIC was an entity that really grew out of an idea that came from civil society. But it did have some support from public actors within Guatemala itself. Some Guatemalan official once said to me when I was in government, he said, you know, the problem for us is we don't really know who we can trust and who we can't trust. We don't know who's in bed with various drug lords and who's not. So there was an advantage to having an external organization. And that's a very nice, positive story. On the other hand, most stories are not so positive. They don't result in such positive outcomes. And it's because it's really tough to kind of penetrate these societies and alter the incentives that political leaders have. And I think it's absolutely right to say that if you're a member of civil society and you're an activist, and even if you have nothing but the best intentions, that power and the use of violence is in the hands of the state. And it's not easy to resist this. But in your paper, one of the things you say is, you know, we should, we should push for securing physical integrity rights, but we should accept that there will be limitations in many places on freedom of expression, freedom to organize protests, these sorts of broader package of rights. So, so here's a, I mean, a, a problem, an analytic problem, and an empirical problem that I have in thinking about this issue. Um, the policy prescription that I'm advocating is really drawn from a, a body of work that, at least in the U.S., has been labeled rational choice institutionalism. And the basic idea here is exactly this notion that what's key to moving towards sustained economic growth and democratization is to somehow have a set of incentives for political elites that make it likely that they'll move in that direction. Right. 
A basic failing, though, with rational choice institutionalism is that it, it, it just describes this bifurcated world. Either you're an open access, inclusive order, if you look at Asimov and Robinson's terminology in North Wallace and Weingast, or you're an exclusive closed access order. Well, that's clearly an inadequate description of what actually exists in the world, since there are clearly a bunch of states in the middle. Now, the problem is, how do you understand those states? How do you describe them? Well, in theoretical terms, I would say, we should understand states in, in the middle as states where there are political and economic elites who have an interest in a more open access system for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if I were to, I don't know if I could empirically sustain this, but if you look at Karzai, Karzai was just a Pashtun nationalist and deeply corrupt. Um, if you look at Ghani, Ghani is a guy who has had his foot in both worlds. I mean, he has a PhD from Columbia, worked at the World Bank for a long time. His kids have gone to elite universities in the U.S. Um, there's a better chance, I think, that Ghani would have an interest in promoting real reform in Afghanistan than would ever have been the case with Karzai. So it's fine to say that, I mean, at a theoretical level, I think I can describe states in the middle. Empirically, I don't really know how to do this. And so if you're in the middle, which is where I would put Turkey and Russia, um, since there are clearly actors within those societies who have mixed motives, there I think you have a better chance at doing more. So in another theoretical literature that you know well is bargaining theory, right? And, and, and I guess there's also, you know, there's a psychological element to some of the critiques of the sort of rationalist bargaining theory. Um, and where I'm going with this is that some people change, right? There's static categories, but then there are also people who change. And a, and a really good example of that, I think, is Saif Gaddafi, who at a certain point had become the darling of Human Rights Watch and other organizations. Uh, who thought that, you know, this was somebody who was potentially a reformist. He was letting them into the country, he was talking with them, and then, you know, as we head up to Benghazi and the U.S. and the NATO intervention, he changes, right? He radically changes. So, so is it, you know, does it make sense to try and put states into these static categories, right, where you've got open and closed? So the answer I'm going to give you is, maybe it's too easy. So, yeah, we should engage with people, provided that we recognize that engaging with them is not going to guarantee some kind of good outcome. So was, was Saif Gaddafi just spinning us, or uh, did he genuinely have a set of beliefs which would have been more progressive, but then when he was confronted with a situation where the regime was going to fall, kind of reverted back to what his fundamental interests would be. Mm. And the spinning problem is a, is a deep one. So I'll give you, I mean, another example. When I was in government, I was extremely enthusiastic about the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. This is a multi-stakeholder initiative, uh, which was actually initially funded by Norway. One of the first countries to actually be certified by EITI, and certification meant that the idea here was that countries that are producing raw materials would make visible to their own public, so it would make transparent the income that they were getting with the expectation that if the income was transparent, um, there would be, the public would act against corruption. One of the first countries to be certified by EITI was Azerbaijan, which then and now is still rated like 140 out of all countries in the world by Transparency International. But the Azeris, here was a situation in which the Azeris knew very well that the West really liked this idea. They supported the idea. They held meetings for EITI in Azerbaijan. And they actually got certified, and they just moved the corruption to someplace else in the system. Mm -hmm. So you could say, well, maybe, you know, I don't know if we believe that Aliyev or some other guys in the, in, in the Azerbaijani government actually believed that they wanted a more honest, open system, or maybe they were just spinning us. So I would say it's very hard to know whether you're being spun or not. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't have put some bets down on Saif Gaddafi. I think that makes sense, but recognizing this, I know, is a cop-out, that if you're doing that, don't think that this is going to guarantee some kind of good outcome, because we really don't know exactly what these guys are doing.
But there's a sense in your paper of we shouldn't try. Now let, let me let me leave yeah, that, yeah. but ask you, and you can come back to that. But you mentioned your government government service, which of course was you know very significant role had policy planning 2005 to 2007. Um, how has that shaped your thinking? I mean, is this is your you know good enough governance? Is it a reaction to a very difficult period of U.S. engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan? Um, is that what this is really motivated by? Certainly, can I mean reflecting on that experience. So, what was completely convincing to me in government was that the highest officials in the United States, including the president, were completely committed to this project of democratization. And if you look at the 2002 National Security Strategy, uh, the first one produced by the Bush administration, there really was a coherent grand strategy, and it was. We're confronted with transnational terrorism. It's an existential threat. We have to deal with root causes. The root causes are repressive autocratic regimes in the, in the Middle East or parts of the Islamic world. To deal with that, we have to promote democratization. We're going to intervene in Iraq. We're going to transform Iraq into a democratic country. So forget about worrying about this Iran-Iraq conflict and balance of power. Um, once we have Iraq as an effectively functioning democracy, it will serve as a beacon for other states in the Middle East, and this will be great. And I think that was a bridge way, way too far. If you look at the distribution of per capita income, there are some, I'm getting this about, I'm guessing a little bit, but there are about 35 countries with per capita incomes above $20,000 per capita. So let's say you say that's, if you exclude the, the oil exporting states, let's say that's the OECD world. There are only about 20 countries with per capita incomes between fifteen dollars and $20,000. Well, if you think that's the in the middle, that leaves you know, 140 countries in the failed state category. But if you think the boundary is not 10 to 15, 15 to 20, but the middle boundary is really 5 to 20, say, or even 2,500 to 20, that's a much bigger set of countries. And I don't have, I mean, I, I know that saying that what defines countries in this middle category is political elites who have mixed motives. Mm. Um, it's fine to say that, but how to operationalize that, I'm, I don't have any, I have not solved that problem. I shouldn't say I don't have confidence that I've solved that problem. I have not solved that problem. And the bigger that pile of states is, I mean, the... The, the less relevant this, the good enough governance idea is, because the good enough governance idea, I think, really applies to situations where you have rent-seeking, closed-access political orders in which the political elite has no incentive to politically reform. And don't delude yourself into thinking that they're going to search, that we can go and persuade them to think in some different way. But you don't, you don't talk about institutions, which is interesting, because, you know, when you say elites have mixed motives, well, elites have mixed motives everywhere, right, as you well know. Um, and, and yet it seems that it's institutions, which it must be some, that is in your story, but you, some, for some reason you don't really use the word, which is kind of, you know, at the at the center of a lot of work on transition and, and the ability to you know, produce good governance, it's about domestic institutional capacity, right? Yes, yeah, so that, I have to say, Leslie, is a great question. Um, so let me say, so I'm very, let me stay, stay with the, the sort of bottom fragile states category. I'm skeptical of arguments here that you have institutions which are constraining on political actors. And if you do have institutions that are actually more competent, they are, they are more likely to be in, instruments of repression than instruments of constraint on political leaders. So the real trick in getting to this OECD world, and this is a big distinction between ra rational choice institutionalism and arguments about institutional capacity, the big distinction is that in institutional capacity arguments, think Hobbes and Huntington, and I would say also Fukuyama, the basic idea is that we're going to try to construct institutions that are more effective and can build state capacity. So we'll build courthouses. We will train judges. We'll have IMET programs for foreign militaries. Um, we'll have rule of law programs in which Americans from Kansas go and lecture Afghani police in Mazari Sharif about rule of law. 
and that somehow we're going to convey information or maybe provide physical assets that make institutional capacity more effective. Mm -hmm. The big question that rational choice institutionalism raises about that approach is why do you think that political elites would use those institutions for public purposes? Hmm. And so there, I think just thinking that you have greater institutional capacity doesn't mean that you're going to have better outcomes. So uh, how, how, how easy has it been to, been to persuade a broader audience that we should, that we should sort of give up the ghost and uh, go for good enough? I mean, people this hate is this a difficult right. argument to make. Yes, people hate this idea on all sides. So um, let me say, I think the good enough governance is... It's not a good label. So part of it's a labeling problem. That's provocative. Too, yeah, but too patronizing. And there was some literature on good enough governance, which is what, which I grabbed onto. But I, I'll have to think about some other label. But I haven't found one yet. I, I thought for a while about um, Rawls's notion of decent governance, mm. but which is kind of validated because it comes from Rawls, even though I think this book on you know, law of peoples is. It would be better if we'd read a little more international relations theory. <laughs> but it's pretty, I mean, decent governance is actually really pretty damn good governance, more than I think that we can hope for. So I need a, I do need a better label. Um, and a better label might assuage, you know, people are looking at this and saying, this is just patronizing BS from somebody sitting in, you know, in the, in the OECD world. However, more serious problem is, and I, I certainly see this in the United States with clarity. And I think the same thing is true in Germany, where I've spent a fair amount of time. It's, people hate this idea in government. And I think they hate it for at least two reasons. So one reason is, at least speaking for the United States, there is this, deep, this Wilsonian belief is, is widespread in the US and readily accessible. And even if you don't go all the way to Wilsonianism, let's say women's rights. Mm -hmm. There's a real constituency for women's rights, and when people are thinking about women's rights in the United States, they're thinking about Scandinavia. They're not thinking, well, maybe in Afghanistan what women's rights means is that we'll be able to give girls primary education because their fathers want them to do this, but then they're gonna marry them off anyway. Right. Um, and we're not gonna be able to do more than that. So selling this, these more modest objectives is very difficult in an American context, and I actually think also in a German context. That's one problem. Second problem is, and I, this I'm also seeing with greater clarity in the US government, though it may be true elsewhere, is that the policy instruments which we've constructed over a long period of time essentially rest on modernization theory and institutional capacity theory. We know how to train foreign militaries. Our, the US military knows how to do that. We have no idea how to get the foreign militaries to fight for their own government. Um, so we have the technical capacity to do many things, um, but we don't have the capacity to think about you know, how we might move to a set of policy objectives which don't in some way mirror I mean, the way Americans think about themselves. Right. So I think these right. are both big impediments, both the, the, set of, the way in which a government is now organized to conduct policies towards fragile states, one, and two, these ideological beliefs, which I think are very deep-seated in the U.S. and very significant in Europe, too. Because it's one thing to, to have a limited aspiration. Um, it, it, that's, quite, that's a much harder objective, right? To, have, to limit the aspiration as opposed to have the strong aspiration and accept a compromise in terms of the outcome. Absolutely correct. And, um, and it's hard to make that, you know, what's the speech that Hillary Clinton makes as Secretary of State in which he says... You know, we're spending billions of dollars in Afghanistan for women's rights, and really what we're getting is primary education for girls. That's right. And I guess maybe a final question for you is, you know, it's, it, is, it still doesn't, you haven't fully answered this question of good enough for whom, because in your last remark, you know, in primary education, women's rights, it seems like, in, in a sense, what underpins this is there's a domestic power structure. And we've got to sort of capitulate to that at a certain point. We have to we have to accept and recognize that, and really that usually means you know the men who control the society. And so um, it is a recognition of 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 a kind of baseline of power that we can't really overturn. 
So good enough for existing elites, basically. Yes, good enough for existing elites, but I would also say that if you're thinking about what I, the components that I've kind of put into good enough governance, so some degree of security, some economic growth, provided that economic growth is incentive compatible with the interests of, of national elites, tolerance, not necessarily inclusivity. Inclusivity is one of these now. Right. new catchphrases for the development world. But tolerance, think about developments in Europe after 1648, in which there was not religious freedom. Mm. Um, there were minority rights and the rights of the designated religion. So Catholics had, I'm not sure when this changed in the UK, but you know, maybe at the, sometime in the 19th century, but Catholics had subordinate rights. And if you had subordinate rights, I mean, you might be able to worship in your own home, you might be able to build a house of worship outside of the city walls, but you didn't have equal rights with the official religion. Why was this regime of religious toleration accepted in Europe? Not because European, relig Euro European political leaders believed in it. They certainly did not. But because religion was so volatile, I mean, you have the English Civil Wars, you have the Thirty Years' War in Germany, you have the religious wars in France, that political rulers recognized that religion was such a, such a volatile issue that it could upend the political order. And what they opt for is religious toleration. And the first... But when you start saying religious toleration, right, security, some economic growth, but religious toleration takes you you to a whole new standard, especially when you start talking about the Middle East and many different parts of the globe, right? That's a much higher standard. Good enough suddenly becomes actually quite good if you can get many of, many of the parts of the world that you're talking about to, to take religious toleration as the standard for what, you know, the West will accept. That's, that's pretty, that's a high bar. Okay, so <laughs> let me not be, you know, too argumentative, but if you look at the traditional Islamic world, or say the Ottoman Empire, you have this millet system. Um, Catholics, and, I'm sorry, Christians and Jews are regarded as people of the book. Um, they're in some kind of subordinate position. They're not given the same rights that Muslims have. Um, they're not taxed in the same way, um, but they're not arbitrarily killed either. So in that sense, okay. I'm thinking about, I am thinking about, your, your point's completely fair. I'm thinking about religious toleration here as some, a more modest, a, a pretty modest set of objectives mm -hmm. in which people won't be subject to the arbitrary power of the state. Okay. Um, so they can have their own private beliefs, but those beliefs aren't going to be co-equal with the beliefs of, the, of recognition recognized authorities. This has been fascinating, uh, Professor Krasner. Good enough governance. I think that we will have quite a robust discussion this afternoon um, here at SOAS. Thank you for visiting London and coming to SOAS. Thanks. Um, thanks for these. And, thanks. Those uh, are wonderful questions. So thank to, you so much. To the next, to the next conversation. Great. Thank, thank you. you.